Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the for loop in Visual Basic. The for loop is another construct we can use for looping logic, but it can only be used for counter controlled loops. Sentinel controlled loops, also called indefinite loops, that iterate an un unknown number of times where we don't know the number of times ahead of the loop. Um, those cannot be implemented with the for loop. The for loop is used exclusively for counter controlled loops. The reason why programmers often choose to use a for loop is because it combines three separate steps that we do in the do while loop. If you recall, every loop needs to initialize the loop control variable, have a test that compares the loop control variable to some value, the, basically the loop continuation condition, and the loop has to alter the value of the loop control variable. That keeps the loop from being an infinite loop. So in other words, it eventually ends. The for loop syntax looks like this. We start with the keyword for, counter variable, whatever the name of that variable may be, such as count, equals, and then we specify a start value. So for example, if we were trying to create one of our earlier examples that started count at zero, this would say for count equals zero, two, and then we provide the end value that um, we want to go to. So for example, if we were going from zero to four, the end value would be four. Step, and then the amount that you wish to add to that counter variable each time through the loop. So if your loop is to add one to count, which would be the usual case, this would say step one. Inside the for loop, you have the statements that you want to accomplish. And finally, the keyword next. Following the word next, sometimes you will see the counter variables named repeated. So for example, again, if our current counter variables name was count, this would say next count. This piece right here um, is optional. Most of my examples just have the keyword next. Um, they do not necessarily need to be explicit and name the counter variable in this position. So as I already said, counter variable set to a start value goes to an end value. Um, I already mentioned the counter variable here at the very end after the keyword next is optional. One thing I didn't mention is up here at the top, Following the keyword step, as I said, we, this is where you specify the amount to be added to your counter variable each time through the loop. If the keyword step is omitted and the value following it, a step one will be assumed because step one is the default value for a step, for a step value. Let's take a look at an example. The example that we're looking at here will display all the numbers to the user 1 through 10. There we see our output 1 through 10. Now if we take a look, this is using a do while loop. So it's important to realize that do while loops can be used to implement counter controlled logic such as it is in this example, and it can also be used to implement sentinel controlled loops, whereas the for loop can only be used for the counter controlled loop type. So let's take a look. This particular program has a constant num loop set to 10 and a counter variable we're using um, to control our loop. We start counter at 1, and then we say while counter is less than or equal to 10, display the number. That gives us the value 1 the first time through, 2 the second time through, and so forth. So line counter is what's responsible for what the user is seeing one time, uh, it will display the counter one time per iteration through the loop. So when counter is one, it displays one, and then it increments counter, counter becomes two. We hit the keyword loop and jump back up, counter two is still less than or equal to 10 and so forth. So it has these pieces, the initialization of counter, the test for less than or equal to 10, and the step that updates counter. A lot of programmers like the for loop. I'm going to go ahead and replace this logic with a for loop. What you're looking at here accomplishes exactly the same goal as the previous do while loop. If we would go ahead and run it, we see the same output. 
It begins counter at one. We can see the initial value following the keyword four, and we specify that it should go up to 10. Num loops is equal to 10. Notice that that value is inclusive, meaning that when counter is 10, it will run one more time. And this is indicating to add one to counter each time through the loop. So the nice thing about for loops is it kind of takes your code, makes it a little more concise. And it's also difficult to forget to increment counter because it's built into, baked into the structure of the for loop. Let's take another look. This is an, a different example. I'm going to go ahead and run it first so we can see what it does. Enter rainfall amount for day one. I looked behind the scenes. I know that the rainfall can be specified as a uh, whole number, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be a value like 1.2. And it goes through and asks the, for the rainfall for seven days. At the end of the seven days, it provides for me the average rainfall. So first of all, if this is a loop that runs exactly seven times, we know it's a counter-controlled loop. The prompts are nice. Uh, we're getting a, or, or, I'm sorry, the output is nice here. It says day one, day two, day three. Um, we've kind of incorporated a counter variable so that each time we output the rainfall for the given days echoing the user's input, we're actually printing the day of the week as well, which is a nice little feature. And then we average the values together. We know we can do that by each time we get a new day's rainfall, adding that into some running sum, and then at the end, calculating an average based on that sum and dividing the sum by seven days. So let's take a look. You could certainly do this with a do while loop, but here we've elected to use a for loop because it is a counter controlled loop and we can do that. So we have our normal things up here a sum to collect the sum, a counter. String rain represents the user's input. Um, rainfall is the user's input converted to a double. That's our numeric value. We also have a numeric average. And finally, days and week is a constant set to seven. So we get started with our for loop and we set counter to one, that's initializing counter variable, and we say two days in the week. Notice this example does not have a step value. After days of, in the week, uh, it does not say step. Now remember, if the step value is omitted, it is the same as if I had written step one. Step one says at the end of this loop, add one to counter. That's what a step value of one means. When it is omitted, uh, one will be added automatically. So that action to add that piece right there really did not change anything. The program behaves exactly the same way. Starts counter at one. It gets the rain value from the user and then it converts it to a double outputs the value to the user, we see that output said day one, day two, day three for the various rows. We're actually using our counter variable uh, to indicate which day we're currently on. So that's a nice feature. Takes the rainfall and adds it to the sum. This is the same as writing sum equals sum plus rainfall. We're just using the assignment operator plus equals as a shorthand here. Next, and next represents the end of the definition of the for loop. When the flow of the logic reaches the word next, it actually jumps back up to four and continues with the next iteration. So it works very similarly to the do while loop. It just has a, a altered syntax where we've combined several things into one line of code. After the loop terminates, and it will terminate when counter is equal to eight. So when it goes through, when counter is seven, um, it gets to this part right here at the end of the loop, one will be automatically added to counter because of step one. And uh, again, if that were removed, the default value, step one would be added, jumps back up, eight 
is no longer in the range of 1 to 7, so the for loop ends and it would jump down to calculate the average. It will divide the sum that we accrued through the various iterations of the loop by 7 and finally outputs the answer. Let's see one more example. I can run this one. This particular program asks the user for three exam scores. However, it asks for those three exam scores for multiple students. So to keep things straight, my prompt says student one, enter a score for exam one. So the student received a 100, a 90, and an 88. Notice it calculates the average of the exam scores. Doesn't look like we're rounding it out. We could use a math.round that I referred to in an earlier video, uh, make this a little cleaner looking. But you could see it did calculate the average and displays it for student one. Now it's moving on to student two. So student two, let's say student two received a 70, 77, and a 99. We can see the average of the second exam, uh, second student rather is 82. Now I made this program a little shorter um, with using a class of only two students. But what we're looking at here is a multiples within multiples scenario. We have three exam scores, but we want to process the average of those three exam scores for each student. Whenever that is the case, you're looking at using nested loops. Nested loops can be do while loops. They could be for loops, or they could be a mixture of the two. In this particular example, it uses for loops to process a given number of students. If you look at the outer loop here, this loop starts a student counter at 1 and goes up to 2. 2 is the number of students. This was not a constant. It could have certainly been a constant. It just looks like we're using a variable number of students. Um, and setting it equal to 2. So it starts at 1, it goes to 2, and then inside of this for loop, everything inside of here, you have to remember, is in the context of what am I doing for each student. So for each student, I want to set the sum to 0, so I want to start out fresh. Then I want to iterate through and get all the exam scores. So we start an exam counter at 1 and go up to 3, there are 3 exams, and I say, I prompt the user, please enter a score for a given exam, read it in, and I add that score to the sum. So it's important to realize that when you use nested loops, the outer loop has its own counter controlled variable. Student counter controls this loop exam counter controls that loop and that's true of any nested loops they each have their own loop control variable so for each student we'll set the sum at zero we'll get all the exams adding them up iteratively to a running sum we'll calculate the average and then we'll output that average if we had forgotten to reset the sum I'm going to go ahead and comment this out. That's what you call when you put a uh, commenting symbol in front of a line. It means that it will no longer execute when we run it. And I rerun this. Let's say my first student received all 100s. Okay, it says the average for uh, student one is uh, 100. That's correct. Now for student two, Student two received 73 times in a row. And it shows our average of exam scores for student two is 170. Obviously, that's not correct. That's not even in range for a valid um, exam score. And that's because when we, we loop through this outer loop for students, we have to be careful. If we're using the sum as an accumulator to accumulate the sums, we want to be careful that the sum does not include the scores from earlier students. So by adding this line here that sets the sum to zero, we basically reset its value to zero so that when we start processing exams for this student, we're not including exams from previous students.